Right, so we're going to speak in a second to the founder of a brand new support group for parents who are concerned about children choosing to pursue a gender transition. This is a mother who is working with a new group and she's told the Telegraph her teenage son was, her words, groomed into taking hormone blockers and she blames the BBC and schools. All of this, of course, comes after the landmark Kira Belcourt ruling, which we covered last week, I think it was, which effectively banned the NHS from giving hormone drugs to teens, and the mayor forced out a ruling which gave so-called gender-critical views legal protection. So joining me right now to discuss this, we've got Stella O'Malley, who's a psychotherapist, author, and founder of Genspect, who is joining us from Ireland, and Katie John Wen, a trans person and gender commentator. Um, let me start with you, if I may. Um, Stella, what is happening here? Well, the reason well, the we uh, set up Genspect was because so many parents were coming to different parent groups all over the world, and they were all saying the same thing, that they were unhappy with the medical treatment that they were receiving and the therapeutic treatment that their children were receiving because they felt their children were being fast-tracked. And these were generally children who were autistic, had ADHD, had an awful lot of trauma, had been isolated. These were really children with an awful lot of distress. And, and all the parents who come to our parents' meetings were saying, the other issues aren't being addressed. They're not seeing these children in a holistic way. And what they're just seeing is once the word gender comes into the situation, the kids are being told to medically transition and medically transition fast. And because so many different, I, I work as a facilitator in some of these parents support group meetings, because so many parents were saying the same thing about the same type of child, as in a quirky, awkward, distressed child who's spending an awful lot of time online. It didn't make sense. And we thought we should harness all the voices of all the different parents groups and create one organization that speaks for those parents who feel they're silenced because they're afraid to speak out because their children are highly vulnerable and very distressed and the parents don't feel that they're receiving the most appropriate care that they could get. And they're certainly not receiving depth work. They're receiving a very shallow version of their problems. And Casey, is this something that you recognise, what Stella's just been explaining, that if a child so much as mentions a slight confusion about gender, then they're almost fast-tracked into this pathway in terms of looking at potential transitions? Is that fair? Is that what's happening? I don't think it's... Well, it's, it's, it's it may be people's perception, but it's not a reality because there is no such thing as a fast-track within the NHS. It's, it's a six-year journey and it's a three-year waiting list, so you can't really be fast-tracked on a three-year waiting list to even get in the door. Um, I also run a parent support group um, for parents of trans, parents and partners of trans, and there's no fixed view within that group. People are, are welcome within that group to say, I have a problem with my kid transitioning, and we give them space to discover um, their child's journey and their own. So, but yeah, I don't think the fast track is, is, a, is a thing for the majority of people. It's the opposite. So, so, Stella, what do you think to that then? Kate is saying that there is no such thing as a fast track uh, route into transition. I think, I think um, uh, what the, there's a huge issue because what happens is an awful lot of these children are um, not being seen by the NHS. And then the, when they're finally seen after three years of waiting, they suddenly get seen for three sessions, just like Kira Bell did. After three sessions, she was prescribed puberty blockers. She was deeply distressed. She had a lot of different problems. And yet after three uh, sessions was prescribed puberty blockers. So that's what I mean by fast track. The waiting list is a, a, a appalling and it shouldn't be happening. But one of the reasons that there is a waiting list is because there's a, a misconception that only gender specialists can speak to children who have distress about gender, when actually any competent and qualified therapist could have a very good relationship and make a huge difference to somebody who has gender-related distress. And this specialisation, this idea that only the gender therapist, and may I point out there isn't a legislated, recognised degree or master's that will actually give you the kind of the accreditation as a gender specialist. It's a fairly easy course. I've done it myself. It's fairly basic. There isn't any hard, difficult kind of route into becoming a gender specialist. And yet people are waiting three years, four years to see these so-called specialists. And then after three sessions with them, 
they receive puberty blockers. So that's a massive issue. Can I just say that I do find that there's one thing that's being said at the parent support groups that I'm meeting. And one thing that the parent support groups are saying is that they can finally tell the truth and that they've been at other parent support groups where they're told without a, without any kind of equivocation, they're told you need to support your child because if you don't support your child, they might die by suicide. And if they do that, that, that will be all your fault. And actually, anybody who knows anything about suicide, and if you do know anything about suicide, go and get, you know, help if you have any issues around it and certainly seek professional help. But you wouldn't ever say that to somebody because it's an inappropriate thing to say, because actually distress is wider than that and it's bigger than that. And you need to be very careful about using words like that, because it'll be it'll be the wrong and inappropriate and almost suggestible thing to young children to hear that. So it, there's a, a narrative out there that parents need to always support their child to medically transition, even if that child has autism, even if that child has been bullied and ostracized and has spent an inordinate time online because they have no friends and they have nothing else in their life. Even then, those children are being told that the best thing they could do is transition and transition as fast as possible. And their biggest problem is a waiting list rather than why don't we see a therapist and speak about all your issues? And why don't we go look at this through a kind of a wider perspective so that we can help you in your entirety rather than just thinking all you are is a walking gender identity and there's nothing else to you because most people are much more than that and much wider than that. Let me ask you briefly, if I may. Um, I've got to say, when I was growing up, I don't remember there being so many children that wanted to change gender. And it seems recently that this has really become a big thing. Like we were speaking, I think it was last week, in terms of how the numbers have quite dramatically increased. What is driving this? Well, there was something that's been was described in 2014, the transgender tipping point. You know, the point at which the first trans person graced the front of a Time magazine cover. Being seen, trans in media, trans in TV, whether it was good or bad media, it was neither here nor there, but being visible made a lot of people notice that, they, that, that that's how they felt on the inside. There's always been trans people. That goes back through centuries and, of different cultures and all kinds of things. What we do have now that is different are medical options. We have legal laws. Those things weren't present in the past. But I'll pick up something that Stella said that I would agree with as well, which is people don't always expect um, trans people to agree with people who are also being critical of it. But one of the biggest issues is the lack of well-being, mental health, psychotherapeutic support services. When I began to transition, it was one of the compulsory things. You had to go into three-month therapy. That's not a compulsory thing anymore because there isn't even the provision for it. The mental health, uh, mental health should be following and backing up what there is with physical health, which is the 18-week maximum wait time. You should be able to get access to mental support within 18 weeks. It just doesn't exist either. So you don't even get support while you're considering transition. You just get this massive delay. And there needs to be more support services. And the comorbidity with things like um, ADHD, with things like autism, um, they are considered by the psychiatrist. And it was considered when I transitioned. It was one of the questions they asked you in the interviews. Do you have these other things going on? Yeah. So they were, they were checking for those issues. Um, but I think there is a, they're overwhelmed with the massive demand. Um, my city, Norwich, they were treating uh, around 100 new trans patients every year. And it has definitely gone up. We know the statistics about the, the Tavistock and Portman was treating 100 people 10 years ago. Now it's treating 3,000. But it's still three years to get in the door for that. Yeah. 3,000 is still a minuscule number of people within the population as a whole, though. And the number that go on puberty blockers and the number that are described as kids, not teens, um, are in the mere hundreds Puberty blockers are normally administered around age 15, and only about 17% of trans people even ask for them. This is interesting. I mean, I find this subject absolutely fascinating, and for time reasons, unfortunately, I need to leave it there, but I'm sure we will uh, revisit this subject again. Um, and I think, as Stella mentioned there as well, there's lots of parents that are trying to navigate their way through this um, and really quite afraid. I think Stella mentioned there that if you don't support them, then you've got the risk of suicide, etc. So, you know, it must be very challenging um, for, for parents and um, the children as well. So, uh, thank you both very much for your time. As I say, I'm sure this will be an issue that we will continue to come back to in future weeks.